Good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Parsons, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar titled Dietary Supplements, a Necessity or Folly? This webinar is brought to you by the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association. We would like to thank them for their support and encourage you to visit their website to learn more about the American sheep industry and to access the large volume of services and resources available from ASI to help you be successful in the sheep business. The URL for the ASI website is www.sheepusa.org. You can access the Let's Grow materials by clicking the Rebuild link under Programs on the main menu of the ASI website. You can also access those materials directly with the URL www.growourflock.org. Before we begin, I'd like to remind our listeners that this webinar is being recorded. All webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email within the next 48 hours with a direct link to the webinar recording as well as a link to access the webinar slides. Links to these materials, as well as the recordings and slides from our previous webinars, are also posted on the Let's Grow website. We are slated for a approximately 45 minute presentation, followed by about 20 minutes of questions. Feel free to submit your questions at any time, including during the presentation, by typing them into the question dialog box at the bottom of your control panel. I will be monitoring those questions throughout the evening and moderating them to our speaker during the Q&A session to follow his presentation. If you have a microphone, you may also ask your questions directly to the speaker by raising your hand. I will go over that process after the presentation before we start the Q&A session. It is now my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Robert Van Son. Dr. Van Son is an extension veterinarian and professor of veterinary science at Penn State University. He earned a bachelor's degree in zoology, a master's degree in large animal clinical sciences, and a doctorate in veterinary medicine, all from Michigan State University, before going on to earn a PhD from Cornell University in ruminant nutrition. Dr. Van Son's research and extension program at Penn State is focused on ruminant nutrition as well as preventative medicine programs. And he earned uh, what I would call the ultimate compliment in that he was recommended to me as a speaker for one of these webinars by a young producer, which tells me that uh, he knows his stuff and he's up to date. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Van Son for this evening's presentation. And uh, it's all yours. All right. Thank you very much, Jay. Thanks uh, for everybody chiming in yet tonight. Um, Good evening to everybody, and let's go ahead and get started. Got a lot of things to cover, and it seems like I already got some questions coming out, so uh, we'll get going here. So, dietary supplements, a necessity or a folly? What is a supplement? You know, we can look at this. The Webster Dictionary says something that completes or enhances something else when added to it. So what we're looking at here is, is it necessary to add additional source of essential or useful nutrients to complement a forage diet? Mainly because, of course, the forage-based diets you know, are what we're focusing on in feeding sheep to keep our costs down. And so the big question then comes, does forage-based diets need supplements? If you look on the panel on the side, here's all our list of essential nutrients. And obviously, you know, forage, if it's pasture, contains a fair amount of water, but if it's hay, not. But the main things we're going to be looking at and discussing tonight are things like energy and protein to meet the needs of the, the animal, as well as these macro, micro uh, nutrients and vitamins. So as I mentioned, you know, forage or our feeding program is the largest single entity that accounts for our production costs in sheep production. And so any small percentage reduction in feed costs can greatly affect profitability. We assume that our forages are our cheapest feeds, and that may not necessarily be the case this coming year with some of the weather issues that we've had in different regions of the country and shortages of forages, but in general, forages are our cheaper feed, and 
we just tend to try not to add that additional uh, supplementation, high co higher cost supplementation of protein or some of the, the minerals. So the question then for what I'm going to try and cover today is why would a supplement be needed for a forage-based diet? Now we can put this in another way and I'm going to talk a bit about evaluating and say, you know, how does your forage limit or promote your feeding program? So, so again, focusing on just what we may need and why we may need something to our diet. So let's start out thinking about meeting the needs of the, of the you. And if we look at this graphic here, this is just your classic graphic of sort of the sheep production cycle with the uh, uh, early March lambing period. You have digestible energy off here on the uh, x-axis, and we're looking at what the energy would need to be on a daily basis in early gestation, moving up to uh, late gestation, up through lactation, and then you can see the big drop off when you wean those lambs off and you have that ewe and their, her dry non-lactating period. Then as you get ready for the next breeding, we'll bump that energy up some for flushing and then on. And you can see the dotted line here just represents the natural you know, flow. The ewe obviously just has, doesn't have these immediate increases or decreases but this is the overall scheme. And what I want to focus on tonight, uh, with the limited time that we have to discuss all of this, is really, to me, what the most critical time period is, and that is the late gestation diet and the lactation diet. Because as you can see from this graphic, we have the largest uh, requirement, at least for energy here, and, and for most other nutrients. So let's take a step back and, and think about the science here and I'm going to show you sort of a conundrum that the NRC or National Research Council which is the scientific body that reviews the, the scientific literature uh, and then pulls out of that information what they deem to be the appropriate requirements for sheep and, and there's been uh, a report back in 1985 on sheep nutrient requirements and then one more recently in 2007. So let me set this up. Down at the bottom here you're going to see the different stages similar to the previous graph, your maintenance U, your early gestation U, late gestation with a single fetus, late gestation with twins, and then lactation with a single or lactation with the twins. And then the graphics are going to show either dry matter intake or metabolizable energy or crude protein. So these yellow bars represent what the NRC believes the sheep will be eating at these different time periods. And I, I want to sort of highlight these last four bars here and notice that, you know, I think one of the challenges that the NRC committee had was dealing with the energy requirement and protein requirement of these late pregnant ewes with twins, this, this bar right here, and what she can consume. And you can see here the expectation is essentially that dry matter intake is going to stay the same or go up just slightly in late gestation if the animal has, the ewe has a single versus a twin. And I think most of us, if you saw that picture that I borrowed from Dr. Joe Rook, of a late pregnant use there, you know, where they're about as wide as they are long, uh, I don't think we have these expectations that these use are going to be able to increase with twins, and, and I would argue that our, our data and observations would suggest a decrease, and actually for the goat nutrient requirements, they do show a decrease. The other thing I want you to glean out of this is look at the intake expectation for late pregnancy, these two graphs, versus lactation. There's really not a big difference there. Now let's look at the energy. And again, one of the big challenges we see is these red bars, this you with pregnant with twins, look at how much more energy she requires than the you late pregnant with singles. And so you can see there's obviously this big jump in 
in energy, but yet dry matter intake expectations are about the same. So that means you're going to have to add something to the diet. You're either going to have to improve the forage quality or add some energy content to that diet to meet these needs of the ewe. And if we look at the third bar here, the green bars, this is the protein. And again, we can see a big jump in the protein from late pregnancy singles to late pregnancy twins, and then a huge jump here from lactation singles to lactation twins. So again, I want to focus on the dynamics of what's going on in this late pregnancy and lactation because this really encompasses the profitability side, getting good, live, robust, vigorous lambs born that are healthy and don't have a lot of problems, maintaining good milk production for good lamb growth, and being able to get the ewe bred back and not deplete her too much. So how do we take this science and start to translate it into functional knowledge in looking at your forages? So I'm overlaying here a quick little chart where I calculated based on these NRC numbers using this dry matter intake value, the yellow bar, and dividing it by the red bar and converting it to a traditional measure of energy in the diet, or TDN, total digestible nutrients. And then I took the grams of protein and divided it by the, the green bar, by the yellow bar, and converted it out into crude protein as a percent of dry matter. So, as a point of reference, let's look at the maintenance U. She needs kind of minimal things to keep her going here, about 7.5% crude protein in the diet and about 51-52% TDN. You know, so that's, that's a medium quality to lower quality forage. Now let's come up where we're interested and we can see here the difference between late gestation singles, these two boxes, versus late gestation twins. And we can see there's a bump of almost two percentage units on crude protein, but look at the bump in energy density difference in that diet, even though the U is supposedly maintaining about the same intake. So this shows you the difference in that red bar there. Then if we move over to lactation, notice that late pregnancy with twins has very similar energy density in the diet for your lactating you for twins, it's just that she needs a lot more protein. So let's keep some numbers in mind as I progress through here. Think about the low point of 7.5% crude protein and then somewhere is around 11 to 15% crude protein and then 52 versus 64, 65 TDF. So let's look at our plants. This is what we're going to try and feed. We need to remember whether we're feeding grasses or legumes, legumes being um, your bird's foot trefoil, your alfalfa, your clover types. They all go through developmental stages just like the animal does. So think of the leafy plant as the young nubile lamb and then think of this full bloom, reproductively mature as the old geriatric you, the coal you that's broken teeth, broken mouth and, and everything. And, and then you got everything in between. And, and these lines show you some important nutrients. You could see crude protein, percent leaves, and mineral content of the forages starts out really high and declines with progressive age of the plant, whereas things like the percent stems in the plant and the percent fiber in the plant increase with increasing age. So, so this is a normal physiologic phenomenon of the growth of the plant we all are familiar with. We know that this is all stimulated by the amount of light, the amount of uh, temperature, ambient temperature and light that pretty much drives uh, plant growth and then that's further modified by soil conditions and water. So where should we be targeting? Well, I'm going to advocate that sort of this middle age plant, this is one time when middle age is a really good thing. Middle age plant is really sort of the optimum between the digestible nutrients and sort of fibrous fill of the plant, getting tonnage, having enough, having enough uh, hay or uh, forage resources to get you through the winter until spring comes up again. 
Then I'm going to argue that this very leafy plant, the really lush plant, and the very geriatric old plant are our challenges, and these are the ones that can get us into some some issues. So let me overlay again. Now uh, what I'm doing is I'm showing you the TDN content for alfalfa or legumes versus grasses, the crude protein, and now a measure of fiber called neutral detergent fiber. This is a measure of total cell wall, and as I'm going to show you, this is a strong controller of feed intake in sheep and in other ruminants. So if we take a look at the green box here, my mid-growth, uh, uh, mid-life plants, you can see TDN is between 56 and 60 and 40 to 40 and 50 to 55. So that's right in that range, uh, just short of that 64% TDN. If we look at the protein, that's for legumes. If we look at our grasses, you know, we're a little bit lower than that. Grasses have a little bit lesser energy, so we're going to be a little more challenged to meet that higher end and even the maintenance end in some, some respects um, with the TDN. We look at the protein, we're in really good shape with our legumes, uh, even at this uh, uh, older type, we're still getting up there, even the meat, uh, milk production, but our grasses are going to be somewhat challenged uh, as we move over. If we look at the most mature, we can see we're really under both in legumes and grasses on our TDN and our crude protein. And if we look at our really lush, we're really up there on our energy and, and overdoing on the protein. So, so these geriatric plants are characterized by having really high fiber, measured as NDF, low energy content, low protein content resulting in low feed intake. So these are going to compromise feed intake and they're going to require quite a bit additional supplementation of energy and protein to meet the needs of the productive view. The challenge is, is these are the most abundant grasses. They're poor quality resulting in the weight loss, poor production, uh, potentially leading to issues of pregnancy toxemia, poor milk production. But if you're purchasing hay from somebody growing it, they're probably pushing to this edge, or maybe the weather is pushing them to this edge because they're going to get more tonnage off of the, the field per acre and, and be able to charge uh, for that extra tonnage. If we come over to the really lush, where is the challenges here? Well, as I mentioned, really high protein, very high potassium, very high phosphorus, which We'll get to uh, later on in the talk why that could be an issue. Low fiber, we do see very high intake, but we have really high fermentability. One of the challenges with eating this really lush forage is you know, maintaining what we would call a stable rumen environment, and, and we may even see some potential for acidosis, especially with some cool season grasses and lots, lots of what we call uh, sucrose polymers or fructosans in those grasses. So there are some challenges associated with our, our plants. Let's take a look at the NDF. And this is some interesting data that came from England, uh, older data, 1983. They fed solely a silage-based diet. You can see it's about 25% dry matter, so a fairly wet silage but very high quality, 18.8% crude protein, and about 48 or 48.5% neutral detergent fiber. Now this study, basically they were looking at U performance and, and looking at intake, and they, interestingly enough, ultrasounded these U's or identified these U's as having singles, twins, or triplets. Now what I'm showing you here is the last six weeks of pregnancy, so week 20 would be about 140 days of pregnancy, so just the, the last week here, and then back to week 15. And what I did based on the data presented in this paper, I was able to calculate neutral detergent fiber intake, how much was consumed, you know, how much from this forage on a percent of body weight basis. 
Now for most ruminant species, we consider about 1.2% of body weight as sort of a maximum or, or optimum NDF intake for a lactating or, or a maintenance animal. But with pregnancy, we see a reduction in neutral detergent fiber, which you can see. But what's really interesting here is if we highlight this, um, you know, here we go across 0.8 to 0.7. And if you go across any one of these, we can see that basically there is a reduction within the week in NDF capacity going from ewes that have singles to ewes that have twins. And so that uh, is then coupled also with the possibility that, oops. need to get out of that. Okay. When we look at the progression from week 15 to week 20, we also see this reduction in NDF capacity. So, so what this is saying is NDF is going to limit intake. We know the pregnant animal, these numbers are very consistent with what I see in cattle, a decreased level. So as you go for more uh, highly fertile, more fecundity type use, you're really going to have to manage and watch the neutral detergent fiber in your forages. This is from that same study just to show some other comparisons here. Now we're looking at a very mature grass hay. You can see almost 64 percent neutral detergent fiber versus this 48 percent. This is in weeks 15 to 17 and again singles, twins, triplets and here you can see a lower intake generally, not much, but a lower intake with the higher level of NDF. If we compare the further out pregnant use to the closer up pregnant use with the same level of NDF, we do see more of a reduction as she gets closer with the different number of fetuses. And then once we get into the last two to three weeks, here comparing a 44, almost 45 percent NDF forage, which would be a very good quality grass or sort of mature uh, alfalfa versus 48, you can again see with the lower NDF, we get a little greater NDF intake, probably due to some better digestibility, the lignification of the forage. Now this is another one of my favorite studies. Uh, next to the previous study here, this was a study done at my old alma mater at Cornell by uh, McNeil and, and colleagues. And this study, they fed Dorset ewes that all were pregnant with twin fetuses, and they fed the last 30 days of pregnancy, and they fed diets that were equivalent except for the fact that they had differences in protein. So there was a low protein diet about 8% crude protein, if you remember, that would be just about at maintenance. A mid-protein diet, which was 11.5% crude protein, so that would be just a slightly above NRC requirements as they are current. And then a very high crude protein diet of 15.7. So let's come down and look at the NDF. The NDF was fairly similar, just a slight decrease in NDF to accommodate the extra protein in the diet. But notice the percent of body weight intake, very similar to the English study, around 0 0.7, 0 0.8. But notice this, as we go up to the higher protein, look at almost 0.9% NDF intake. Interesting. So now, what's that due to? Well, I'm going to tell you the amount of protein that's in the rumen, the fiber digesting bugs need protein. If you short them of protein, degradable protein in the rumen, you're going to compromise NDF. So by adding more protein, we probably improved the rumen nitrogen status or rumen protein status and got a little better fiber digestibility. How did that translate into intake? Here, if we look at the numbers, there is a highly significant difference in the dry matter intake across these three treatment groups with the highest intake at about 2.2 percent of body weight for the high protein use versus only 1.65 percent of body weight intake on the low protein use. So 
where does that fit in with NRC requirements, the science that we had uh, that we showed earlier? Well, here's those requirements. So here is a mature 70 kilogram or 150 pound you late pregnancy with twins. They expect her to eat 4.03 pounds of dry matter a day, which is 2.6, 2.6 percent of their body weight. And, and if I just go back, look where we were, 2.2 on our better diet, but look at this, only 165, so way under what NRC is recommending. So here is the requirements, 4.73 megacals of metabolizable energy, 192 grams of crude protein, and then 8.8 .8 grams of calcium, 5.3 grams, grams of phosphorus. What I did is I calculated an NDF requirement based on 0.8 percent of body weight. So that would mean this U would have to consume about 560 grams of NDF. So if you look at the energy density here, these numbers should look somewhat familiar, about 1.8 or about 64, 65 percent TDN, uh, 10, 10.5 percent crude protein, you know, this higher intake at 2.6. But look at what the NDF density of the diet would be, only 30.6%. Now, wait a minute. There wasn't a plant that I showed you earlier in the growth of the plant that was even close to 30% NDF. So, so this is telling us that, you know, the forages, unless you have a really, really good quality early uh, growth forage is probably going to have too much NDF, which means we are going to need some kind of supplement to meet the energy and protein needs. How do we do that? So what I did here is instead of thinking that these ewes could eat 2.6 percent of her body weight, I back calculated to some numbers like here at, here I highlighted the um, 2.2, that was what we saw in the Cornell study. So if we have this, we would need, she would be eating 3.4 pounds of dry matter, not 4.0. And to meet these needs, which I think are very robust, 192 grams of protein, 4.37 gram, or, uh, megacals of energy, her energy density would not be 1.09, it would be 1.29, and the crude protein would not be 10.3, it would have to be 12.4% in the diet to meet these needs. What this is doing is this is backing off on, enter, on a feed intake up to 1.8% of body weight. You could see the calculated uh, NDF content of the diet reduces to something that we're much more potentially able to achieve with some better quality forages. So two lessons here, poor quality forages, high NDF forages have absolutely no place in the late pregnant used diet and it's only going to set you up for failure. The other thing is, is we're most likely even with some decent quality forage is going to need to add some energy and or protein supplement whether it be soybean meal, cottonseed meal, you know, whatever, canola meal, things like that that are going to help meet the nutritional needs of the youth. Why is that so important? Why am I so focused on this late pregnant youth? Well, feeding in late pregnancy really is the key to success or failure in the sheep production, whether uh, and, and this goes for dairy production or beef cattle production. If we're underfeeding, as we just described, we have a greater chance of metabolic disease, maybe hypocalcemia, maybe pregnancy toxemia, a poor supply of colostrum, which is obviously going to adversely affect survivability of the lamb, poor milk yield on the ewes, which is going to affect growth. If this problem is even further into the pregnancy period, we may see small or large weak neonates, newborn lambs, and all of this resulting in high postnatal uh, losses in the lambs. So here's this same McNeil study that I showed you some data from the Cornell earlier, where 
they actually euthanized these ewes and, and measured uh, the protein status in these ewes. And so they looked at the wool and the protein in the wool. And you can see across these three diets, this is low crude protein, mid crude protein, and high. There was, really was no effect on the protein being deposited in wool. There was really not much of an effect on the protein being deposited in the mammary gland or udder. And then here you can see slight differences. The lower crude protein, we saw some loss of nitrogen in the visceral organs, so like the liver and the digestive tract, which of course is going to have some implications on feed intake and feed processing. But what is really exciting about this study is this data, is look at this. The low crude protein fed use, the mid crude protein fed use, both lost significant body protein mass, skeletal muscle mass in attempt to compensate for the low protein intake in the diet. This is, this is really key to understanding uh, the success or failure of our pregnant animals. If you look at this line down here, the total lamb weight, you could see these lambs being born to the low protein use actually had about a 14% decline in body weight. They were only 16.5 pounds total weight compared to the 18 and 19 pounds. Now this 18 and 19.2, these two numbers are not significantly different statistically, but notice this you, how did she maintain that lamb birth weight? She lost body mass to do it, whereas this you, she maintained and didn't get larger lambs but she was able to store body protein and thus that body protein now can be used when she hits lactation and can help support milk protein production or maybe even colostrum production. Speaking of that, here's some old data from J.J. Robinson in Scotland where he fed either a low energy or high energy diet with different levels of protein and then measured the amount, the volume of colostrum being generated. Now this is in kilograms, but you could see even on the high energy when he increased the milk, uh, the protein in the diet, you had almost a doubling in the first three hours after birth of uh, colostrum volume. And you can see here on the low energy, again, almost a doubling. and between the low and high energy at the same level of protein, a similar concentration or volume of colostrum. Another important issue is in late pregnancy, there's some new research coming out showing that protein status of the ewe in late pregnancy influences her ability to fight off parasites and, and control the egg count. And so they fed diets that were either only 85% of the metabolizable protein requirement or slightly above at 130%, similar to that high protein. And what they found was improved body protein status and uh, reduced fecal egg counts and improved immune status. So if we take a look at some of this data, this upper graph right here is for single rearing use. And you can see for singletons, not a big difference. The open circles represent the ewes that were fed inadequate protein, and these are looking at fecal egg counts and eggs per gram. But if you look at the twin rearing ewes, here's the time of lambing right here at time zero. Look at these ewes that had twins that were fed inadequate protein in pregnancy, and look at the spike that you get close to 500 uh, eggs per gram here right within the first week and then again at week 28 another time, which is basically going to really increase the uh, egg problems in the environment for those newborn lambs. This is another interesting study here where they did basically the same thing. All the ewes in these two graphics had twins, but here during mid-pregnancy, they fed them to maintain body protein or they fed them to reduce body protein. And you can see when they reduce body protein in mid-pregnancy and then underfed them in late pregnancy, look at the spike that we're getting. And, and even with the ones that were fed in late pregnancy protein okay, the reduced body protein earlier did compromise immune response, whereas if they maintain body protein early, 
they were able to do a decent job at keeping those fecal egg counts under control. All right, so is your forage appropriately balanced for macro minerals? We talked about energy protein issues and the role that fiber plays, but what about macro minerals? Calcium phosphorus balance is the first thing you really need to take a look at. Here are two grass pastures, one fairly immature. If you take a look here, 17% uh, dry matter, so high moisture, 25% crude protein, uh, very early lush. Look at the NDF at 48, all right? But if we focus on the calcium and phosphorus, here, look at this calcium of 0.46 versus 0.59. Whenever phosphorus is greater than calcium, that's a bad thing in forages. And it turned out the pregnant ewes that were uh, grazing this grass pasture all were coming down with low blood calcium. They were, they were getting into uh, milk fever or hypocalcemia in late pregnancy because we this excess phosphorus intake is going to suppress calcium availability and that's going to result in the you not being able to get enough calcium to meet the needs of the developing fetal bones. If we move over to the second grass pasture, this is a little more mature. You can see the moisture is a little bit higher, crude protein is a little bit less, uh, NDF is a bit higher here at 56. But again, look at this problem a lower calcium than phosphorus, not quite as bad as the previous one. This one is highly fertilized, but this was a pasture that some weaned lambs were being grazed on, and basically the problems were the lambs were being underfed calcium, and they were mobilizing calcium from their bones to the point where if you tried to, <clears throat> excuse me, round them up or, or do anything, process them, they were fracturing their legs. So these lambs were being found out in pasture with broken legs. Uh, and when we radiographed those legs, basically very thin bones there. So where does this come from? Generally, it's an issue by not liming soils, adjusting pH, and really pushing the phosphorus, the nitrogen, the potassium to, to get that plant to grow. If we take a look here real quick, the potassium, K, 5.04% on this forage. That's really high, and 2.6 on this. And that's important for the next issue. One of the other big problems we see with our small ruminants is a high risk of urinary stones, or what's called urinary calculi, especially in the males. And so here's some examples of some pastures, some mixed, mostly grass pasture, and some grass pasture, and then a grass hay that were problematic on two different farms. These pastures here were all fed to some llamas and alpacas that were having stones in the males. And again, if we highlight the calcium phosphorus, notice every one was right at about a one-to-one -one calcium phosphorus ratio or an inverted calcium phosphorus ratio. This grass hay was being fed to some Suffolk rams, and they actually were dying from urinary blockage, and you can see a very low calcium and a very high phosphorus. Again, inverted calcium-phosphorus ratio, bad, 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 bad. We don't want that. This needs to be watched. The other thing I want to highlight is urinary calculi, yes, excess phosphorus in the diet, low calcium in the diet is problematic, but it's precipitated by very high potassium. Potassium in the forage, you can see 2.6, 3, 3, 2.2, 3.2. The requirement for potassium is less than 1%, but we feed heavy potassium to make the plants grow. But when that animal consumes all this potassium, it causes an alkalization or an increased pH in the urine to excrete this potassium. That sets up the right scenario that allows this excess phosphorus in the urine to precipitate. So a high pH, an alkaline pH, allows the phosphorus to precipitate, forming the struvite crystals or the calcium phosphate crystals, thus plugging these animals up. Okay, so calcium phosphorus is an important thing. We may need to supplement some calcium if we have an inverted calcium phosphorus ratio, but we certainly need to look at that in our diet. What about 
minerals, the trace minerals. You know, does your mineral supplement, or do we even need to provide a mineral supplement to your forage? Well, this is a study that came from the Midwest to Western states looking at copper, manganese, selenium, zinc, and iron, and molybdenum, and they characterized 709 forage samples as either being adequate, marginal, deficient, or high in these trace elements, and they had criteria. They were using criteria based on beef cattle requirements, but those are fairly well representative of um, sheep requirements because they were only looking at adequate being about uh, seven parts per million copper and marginal being um, you know uh, five five to seven and, and deficient is less than four or so. So if you notice here uh, of all the forages they had a, a about a 0.7 percent deficient but 66 percent in this marginal range none high but I want to come down and indicate here one of the challenges with copper in our ruminants is that there are other nutrients other elements in the diet namely sulfur iron and molybdenum that interfere with copper availability and so if you take a look at the sulfur you can see there's a, a number of uh, you know here the copper antagonists sulfur iron and molybdenum uh, 33 almost 34 percent were moderate and almost 13 percent were high in sulfur that would antagonize copper availability iron it was lower just 18 and 8 but then look at molybdenum 40 percent moderate versus 8 percent really high so there are some real challenges and I'll, I'll get into this in a moment but if we look at manganese, generally not a big issue. Zinc, look at this, 70, almost 75, 76% of forages are deficient in zinc. And zinc is the single most important trace element because it controls growth, it controls reproduction, it controls hair, it controls wool quality, and, and many other things. And then if we come down and look at selenium, you can see 43% selenium, 26%. Uh, percent marginal. So again, selenium very, very uh, uh, not there in our forages. So, so in essence, we really do need to be providing some kind of trace mineral package to to meet our trace mineral needs of our sheep because our forages are generally inadequate. Now. As I said, that was data from the West and Midwest was a bit different than what we would see in the Northeast or um, Eastern part of the states. I'm just showing you some summarized data from the Dairy One lab in Ithaca, New York. On the right side here, I, I put in the low and high sheep requirements. And you can see overall, we're not doing bad in calcium, but you know, the averages are okay, but we do have some lower numbers, not with our legumes, phosphorus, you know, we're within that range, maybe, you know, right at there, magnesium, you know, we're okay, sodium, we're low, so we need salt, potassium, we're way high. Now, if we come down and look at our uh, trace minerals, we see they're all over the board, all right, so, so a lot of issues, our zinc, you can see, you know, 4.3 to, to um, 49 here are range 25 to 50 the average 23 and 26 so we're right at that low end of requirement copper were maybe a little bit higher but but look at the high levels of copper in some forages I'm actually seeing some copper toxicity uh, in some issues and and this may come back to overuse of copper sulfate in foot baths and some other things on dairy farms and if you're buying forages from dairy farms you better be careful in, in checking that copper but then also notice there's a wide range in the molybdenum and that's something I want to focus on uh, just bring up a, a sheep flock that I've visited and, and we're having some very serious problems um, these were two adjacent sheep flocks one was doing okay under similar management, the other one was having high lamb losses, a lot of like stillborns and weak uh, newborn lambs, and they lost a significant number of their two-year-old ewes. You can see uh, 
some of these ewes not looking very good. Um, when I did these stillborn lambs here, we identified low copper in their livers and normal molybdenum. And then when we looked at the two-year-old ewes, they sort of had normal copper but very high molybdenum. And there was no evidence of infectious agents or, or any other issues that would account for these death losses other than potentially tying up of copper and, and some issues. So when we looked at the forages on the farm that was having problems, I'm showing you the copper and molybdenum uh, measurements that we made for the various forages, and you can see a very high level of molybdenum, well above what I was showing you earlier, and on the farm that was not having any problems, they had a much lower molybdenum. And if you look at copper to molybdenum ratios, uh, these are more appropriate, whereas these, the copper to molybdenum ratios are less than three to one, which is basically inducing a deficient state. This would be resulting by the, the molybdenum gets tied up by the bacteria in the rumen that then bind to the copper uh, and make it unavailable. And it just so happened that the farm that was having the problems was spreading a product that actually had high molybdenum in it, uh, and this was being taken up by the forages and, and resulted in these problems. And it's interesting that they were spreading this mineral for the past two years, and remember, it was only the two-year-olds that were dying. So what other issues do we need to be thinking about in the trace mineral uh, side of things is, milk does not have sufficient trace minerals in it. And so these newborn lambs have to rely on placental transfer and milk or colostrum having high trace minerals to build up their warehouse or stores. And that's all going to be dependent on mom's trace mineral status. So if we're not supplementing mom in late pregnancy, uh, mid to late pregnancy, then we may be shortchanging these, these lambs. We know that all the macro and micro minerals cross the placenta very efficiently. They're heavily stored in the liver without causing toxicity. Colostrum is unique from milk in that it can concentrate trace minerals, whereas milk cannot. In contrast to that, the fat-soluble vitamins that we're worried about, like vitamin A and vitamin D and vitamin E, they do not cross the placenta, but they are highly concentrated in colostrum. And so you know, the big question is if we're not supplementing these things and our forages are, don't have enough of these essential nutrients, is this draining mom status? And all of these are important for her immune function. And is that going to compromise her ability to fight off parasites too? This is some data uh, to finish up here that we did in supplementing ewes, uh, singleton ewes and twin pregnant ewes with selenium, and you can see at the, the far left of the graph, we're looking at blood selenium concentration, a very good marker of selenium status. And we had very good selenium status when we started the study, um, as we started to supplement, and these are used with uh, a whole blood. This would be singles, and dotted lines are multiples. And then this is in the serum, so we could do two either measures. But notice what's happening during pregnancy we see a decline. Even though we're supplementing, we're seeing a decline and a more rapid decline in whole blood selenium here in the ewes that have twins. We move into the lactation phase and we see a further decline down to the point where these ewes out here are now actually deficient in selenium. So again, this supplementation uh, appropriate, at appropriate levels over this time frame is necessary. What are some of the disease consequences? As I mentioned before, energy, protein, micro minerals, especially copper, iron, selenium, and zinc, and the vitamins A and E, deficiencies in these will impair the immune response of mom, and the lambs could potentially have a weakened immune response because they don't have enough of these essential nutrients stored up in their bodies. So this might result in these uh, greater problems with scours, more susceptible to pneumonia in the lambs, or even 
uh, failure to build up a, a adequate immune response to coccidia and recurrent coccidia problems. The big thing, of course, is the, the negative effect, the adverse effect that the parasites would take on these young growing lambs that don't have a good, uh, robust immune response. So my take-home points here, running a little bit late, we need to assess forage quality to determine need for any supplement. Forage NDF may limit intake. We need to think about that and thereby bring in potential energy or a protein um, that may be limiting with mature forages through some kind of uh, supplement. Forage mineral content is dependent upon the species of plant, grasses or legumes, soil conditions, and fertilization practices. Salt should always be available. We saw that salt is very deficient unless you're on the coast and getting uh, sea sp salt spray on your pastures. And then the calcium and phosphorus supplementation is going to depend on the forage and your fertilization practice. And we really want to watch that closely. The big challenge, of course, is trace minerals. Trace minerals are geographically defined. There are no single product is going to work in all areas. So we really need to be looking at uh, a wide um, looking at our forages within our region and seeing if there are any issues. So at the point for questions, but I want to take just one quick moment here to share some information that was sent in by um, one of my, I'm stuck here. Well, let me see if I can get another way for us. Uh, there was a feed analysis I wanted to share with you. All right, so here's a feed analysis. Let's just take a quick look. This is a hay. It's a grass hay. Uh, you can see uh, dry matter 91.9, so that's very good. Uh, look at this, 12.8% crude protein. So that's going to kind of get us up there for late pregnancy. It's not going to do well for lactation. Um, it's certainly going to meet all the other needs of the U. If we come down here and look at the neutral detergent fiber, that's this ANDF, we can see that's at 58. So now this is going to compromise intake. Remember, for that late pregnant U, she uh, only can eat 0.8% of her body weight, so at 58%, she's not going to be able to eat much more than about 1.8% of her body weight and not that 2.2. If we move on down uh, and take a look at our minerals, we can see we got a good calcium level and a good a high phosphorus, but we still have a decent 1.1 1, 1 to 1.1 to 1.5 to 1 um, calcium phosphorus ratio. We do have high potassium, but our calcium phosphorus is okay. If we take a look, our zinc 24, that's that's marginal at best. Uh, copper 9, that's okay. Uh, but look at this molybdenum, 2.6. So this is just like some of these other forages. If we look at this ratio, 9 to 2.6, that's just about a 3 to 1. So potentially, we could see some challenges with copper availability, even though the copper content of the forage is okay. Now, there is a supplement that goes along with this uh, that this person is using. You can see uh, this has some calcium in it, iodine, selenium, and vitamin E. I know it's a little hard. I, I got this maybe too big. If you take a look, there's sodium molybdate in this. Now, they don't give us a number, but I already just showed that the forage is high in molybdenum and maybe compromising copper. If this doesn't have, based on the ingredient list, no copper here, this is further going to add to the molybdenum content and further reduce that copper. So I might be worried about weak lambs, stillborn lambs, some, some other issues with a, essentially a copper deficiency. Now, if you read the directions here, it says to, to blend this with 50 pounds of salt, and this gives you 125 international units of vitamin E per ounce and 2.4 milligrams of selenium per ounce. They feed it a quarter of an ounce per head per day. So that gives us right around that 0 0.6, 0 0.7 milligrams of selenium per day, which is 
minimum. That's that's what FDA FDA allows us to feed 0.7 milligrams of supplemental selenium, but this vitamin E is way too low. Uh, requirements for our late pregnant ewes are going to be anywhere from 200 to about 450, uh, 500 IUs per day. So at a quarter of an ounce, this is only going to be providing about 25 or 30. These ewes are pregnant during the winter time. You're feeding stored forages, very little vitamin A, vitamin E in those stored forages. So these ewes could be potentially deficient on that side. Just finishing up a study looking at stillborns in uh, beef and dairy cows, and I'm finding vitamin A deficiency being a, a key player in these. So uh, just something to be thinking about. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to our host. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Van Zandt. We are now ready for some questions. We've had several of them come in during the presentation, so I'll get to those first. Uh, just a reminder to our listeners, you can type your questions in using the uh, question dialog box um, at the bottom part of your uh, control panel. Uh, you can also raise your hand and uh, ask your question uh, directly to our speaker if that is your desire, uh, and I will call on you by name and uh, unmute your microphone for you to do that if you want to do that. And I encourage you to do that if you have a fairly complicated question. So I'll just go down the list. We have several questions that have come in, so I know we probably won't get to everything in the time that we have here, uh, so let's just get started. Um, first question was, uh, are there differences in copper utilization and susceptibility between wool breeds and hair breeds? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but it, not so much on the wool versus hair breeds, but more the British uh, breeds are more sensitive to copper uh, toxicity issues. They don't clear copper as well as, as uh, the non-British breeds. So that may include some of the, the, the hair breeds. Uh, so that they probably are a little more robust when it comes to copper, but then that may put them into some of these issues that I spoke about. If you have high molybdenum in forages or feed products, uh, it could result in a copper deficiency, an induced copper deficiency state. Okay, so a related question, and you answered it, but just maybe just to twist it a little bit, studies done on the requirement of copper by breed. Have there been studies done by breed on copper requirements? That's a, another question along those lines. Uh, not as robust studies as I would like to see. There's, there's probably more studies that look at some breed differences among beef cattle breeds, but, but more observational uh, reports that have been, um, you know, put through that uh, some case studies that have been reported uh, that gen generally indicate that the British breeds are a little more challenged on the copper side. Okay, very good. Now, early in your presentation, you had a bar chart up on uh, requirements uh, for the pregnant you for the different uh, uh, units. I don't know if you want to go back to that chart or not, yep. but there was a question uh, from our audience on how about requirements for pregnant you lambs. Uh, yeah, this chart right Oh, here. that's a good yeah, that's a good question. Um, pregnant ewe lambs are are going to have, this is for a mature ewe, so what's going to happen here, so if we look at these these two sets right here, they're for like yearling lambs that are pregnant, they're going to have a maintenance, re excuse me, a growth requirement on top of the maintenance and pregnancy requirements. So uh, there may not be as large size but they're going to have very similar energy and proteins, maybe slightly higher than what these mature ewes would be. But the key thing is their dry matter intakes are going to be less. So, so they're going to require an even higher uh, energy and protein density than what we were discussing uh, throughout this, the seminar. Okay, very good. Um, and then uh, when you were discussing the NRC requirements, a question came in, can fodder replace all dry grain with the same or more nutrients available to the dough? Okay, so um, and I think by fodder, I'm assuming they're talking about hydroponic fodder. Right, and this is a meat goat producer, just for clarification. Okay, so if I come back to our forage, fodder is this stuff right here. 
<laughs> it's the real leafy stuff. Uh, the, the, the analysis that I had on fodder, it's not as high in protein as, as one would expect depending on the type of fodder, whether it's corn fodder, barley fodder, or whatever, but it's really high in starch. And, and I caution people, um, it could be a challenge in feeding and, and getting in some acidosis, uh, but certainly feeding some fodder with some decent forage uh, could replace some of the energy um, requirements that one would be bringing in with, uh, you know, say, you know, corn or barley or, or some other cereal grain. Okay, very good. And when you were discussing the calcium to phosphorus ratio, we had some questions pop in on what should the calcium to phosphorus ratio be. Specifically, the question was, should it be two to one? And I don't know if you want to just summarize that again for our listeners. I think that would be good for all of them. Yes, so, so in the total diet, the calcium to phosphorus ratio should be at least, for mature animals, uh, 1.5 to 1 to 2 to 1. We have, that would be the lowest that I would want to see them go. If you have young uh, growing males or feedlot type animals, you definitely want to be above 2 to 1, like uh, 2 to 1 to 3 to 1. Um, we can tolerate higher values within reason. Uh, mature animals could even tolerate a calcium phosphorus ratio of like five to one. Um, it's it's the lower ratios we worry about the most. The higher ratios I would also worry about in in young animals and males because then you could induce uh, calcium uh, crystals themselves. Okay. Very good. And along those lines with the urinary blockages and stuff, a uh, listener asked, would apple cider vinegar be useful against stones? It's a possibility. They've been used before. Uh, we usually come in and try and acidify the animal if it's a struvite stone, uh, which is a, a magnesium ammonium phosphate stone. And so that's why ammonium chloride is used in, in uh, diets with males or in feedlots to try and, um, you know, acidify that urine. Um, you know, apple cider vinegar, vinegar is uh, acetic acid, so there is that potential. My only concern is, is that acidification going to get to the urine or is it going to be, uh, you know, buffered or metabolized by the rumen bugs and, and not uh, get into the bloodstream and, and ultimately in the urine to, to have any significant effect on the pH change in the urine, which is where the minerals are crystallizing. Okay. We have a borderline economic question, but trust me, you don't have to <laughs> answer the economic piece because it says, is there any downside other than financial to feeding high quality alfalfa year round? If so, what adjustments should be made? Um, the only downside of feeding the high quality alfalfa year round is during those lower time periods, if I come back uh, to this graphic, during the dry period, you're going to be grossly overfeeding energy and protein. Um, if you overfeed protein, remember that the U really can't store protein. Now I showed where the U accumulated protein and that's basically it just went into muscle but there's no storage protein like fat you know fat is all energy we don't put protein into fat um, so if you overfeed protein she's gonna have to break down that protein get rid of that nitrogen at an energy cost so um, we you potentially could see issues with excessive body weight weight gain uh, obese use and then that's going to get you into problems in later pregnancy and we also know with some new work which is probably a, a totally different um, webinar to do but how we feed these animals in very early gestation if they're obese or very thin can actually impart some metabolic and nutritional changes on the developing embryo and on the developing fetus it can actually alter the number of hair follicles, alter its ability to, to metabolize glucose and even alter uh, the number of primordial follicles on, on the ovaries in female offspring. So we want to be closer to nutrient requirements with what we want to 
want uh, what the requirements are with how we feed and not really overfeed and and, it, and high quality alfalfa during these periods would be overfeeding. Okay, and if they are short of protein, what sources of protein do you recommend to use? Well, the simple and easiest would be some kind of soybean meal or canola meal, um, whole cotton seed or uh, cotton seed meal. Those would be your typical protein concentrates, ranging anywhere from about you know 24 to to 55 percent protein. If you only need a little bit of extra protein, then things like distillers grains, brewers grains uh, could be a possibility. They run about 24, 25 percent. Uh, crude protein, uh, corn gluten feed, another byproduct that could be very cheap, about 24% protein, corn gluten meal, more expensive, that runs about 65% protein. Okay. Another protein question is, should we be concerned about degradable protein versus bypass protein during lactation? Yes, that's a good Good question and, and one that, again, uh, probably need to get into a little bit more detail. The thing to remember is degradable protein is there to meet the protein needs of the rumen bacteria. That's all it's there because what's going to happen is the bacteria are going to capture that nitrogen, make bacterial protein, and then that's going to flow down and that's going to be the primary source of protein for the ewe herself. So only when we can't meet the increased protein needs of late pregnancy and lactation through degradable protein through bacteria, that's when we have opportunities to feed a little more expensive but useful uh, byproduct or, or uh, undegraded protein feeds like heat treated uh, soybean meals or, or roasted soybean meals or uh, the distillers grains, corn gluten gr uh, meal, things like that. Okay. Um, let's see, a trace mineral question here was, are trace minerals detectable in soil samples or are forage samples more indicative of what one would need to add to a mineral supplement? Yeah, you would be better off doing the forage samples because that's what the animal is eating. We can measure trace minerals in soil, but there's a huge difference between what's in the soil, what's available to the plant, and the pH of the soil and, and water content of the soil, organic matter of the soil, that allows the plant to absorb the trace minerals. There are scenarios um, where the selenium is adequate in the soil, but the plants just can't take it up because of the, the pH of the soil, uh, the acidic soils, or uh, other binding things like high aluminum or other things in the soil. So plant is a, your much better measure of deciding what kind of trace mineral uh, supplement you're going to need. Yeah. And uh, I guess this is a question, it's more of a commentary, but a popular vet does not advocate trace mineral supplementation other than selenium and iodine. However, zinc is critical to a myriad of functions in the body. Who should a producer trust? I don't know if you want to comment on that or not in terms of... Uh... Well, again, if, if we go by what the data I've shown so far tonight, uh, our, our forages are not very good in zinc, and so I certainly would want to be adding zinc, and, and that's such a critical trace element that it I mean, zinc is incorporated in over 250 different enzymes in the body, all controlling uh, growth and, and metabolic activity and reproductive performance and, and quality of the skin, the immune response and stuff. So I, I think that's a little short-sighted. To it, It's simplistic, which sometimes uh, is easier to convey the message to producers, you know, just iodine. So I would even argue that whether iodine is necessary. I mean, boar goats, we definitely need iodine. If you live around the Great Lakes region, northeast, we are sort of iodine deficient in some areas there. But, you know, certainly the selenium is important. I think the, uh, the zinc is important, and I think you're overlooking the, the potential issues of copper being tied up by high sulfurs in our water, uh, high iron in our feeds, or now issues of high molybdenum. I'm seeing a lot of commercial products that are adding molybdenum to 
their product just out of a liability concern of not causing copper intoxication in sheep. Hmm. We have kind of an off-the-wall malignum question here. It says, our county uses slag, which is on their, their gravel roads, from the steel plants that is high in malignum. I need data to give to the supervisors to stop this practice, a good source. You heard of anything along those lines? Well, that's sort of the situation that um, I was describing in this one um, uh, farm, the sheep farm, that where we actually documented uh, copper deficiency in the sheep uh, because of the higher molybdenum. We found the molybdenum in this byproduct of the uh, steel industry that's being sold as a a uh, limestone product. It is very high in calcium, but it has this excess baggage to it. I would encourage that person. I spoke with the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, showed them my data on the molybdenum content and the, the information in this particular farm. They went and took samples, and, and so that's in process. Um, Okay. I don't know, short of you know, finding a farm that's having some problems or, or taking some forage samples near that area to show the copper to molybdenum ratio, that might be at least a start. Okay, thank you. And uh, should I, a question from another uh, listener, should I give the ewes a shot of ADE late gestation? Well, if, if uh, those nutrients are not being supplied adequately in the diet in late gestation, I would certainly consider that. There's, uh, it depends, again, vitamin D, if they're uh, black-faced sheep, if you're in a northern part of the world, uh, you know, north of uh, about the, the 40th parallel or so, uh, during the winter time, these sheep are not going to make a lot of vitamin D, and it's not in our forage in any appreciable amount, so they're going to need that. And I've had some vitamin D deficiencies in lambs and actually seen rickets in newborn lambs due to uh, vitamin D deficiency up in Oregon. <laughs> and uh, I, would, I would consider that. The thing I would caution you is a lot of the commercial uh, kind of generic AD&E products can cause some anaphylactoid type reactions when injected intramuscularly. I would encourage you, if you are going to treat late pregnant ewes, give these injections subcutaneously. The vitamins are absorbed just as well and you'll have less chance of reaction, but I certainly would consider doing that if, if the diet is inadequate. Okay, good. Um, Next question, with respect to fodder, with the water content so high, won't that limit intake due to rumen capacity? That's, that's an old myth that I want to break. Uh, if you think about pastures, you think about uh, New Zealand and Australia, pasture-based feeding systems, the water in pasture is not an issue. It passes through the rumen very rapidly. It actually increases rate of passage in the rumen and it makes more of that highly degradable proteins in pasture less undegradable because it moves through the system so quickly. This is why North uh, New Zealand and Australian systems on uh, pasture-based systems are, are so efficient. Where we see the problem is when we think about wet silage, and the problem there is the ensiling process generates compounds, uh, nitrosamine type compounds, uh, nitrite type comp or, um, uh, nitrogen based compounds that actually have a suppressive effect on the bacteria and on feed intake. So it's not the water itself, it's these compounds coming out of uh, improperly fermented feeds. So I don't have an issue with the, the, the fodder or the pasture in terms of their moisture content. Very good. Um, question, can you tell anything as far as protein changes in their manure? Too much or not enough? Well, to some extent, uh, the problem with sheep and goats are the pelleted manure. Uh, we certainly can see differences in uh, cattle if they are protein starved, uh, where they're you're underfeeding protein to the rumen bugs, they will certainly get more firm manure and you'll see longer fiber particles in the manure. So, so if you start to see some changes in the pellet and if you're 
you're willing to, to kind of feel and break up the pellet and look at the, the fiber particles and you see a lot of really coarse kind of looking fiber particles rather than really fine particles then that might be telling you that there's some some issues going on where maybe the, the rumen is being underfed degradable protein. If we really overfeed degradable protein, we may see some looseness to the manure. Okay. Time for just a couple more questions here. Um, one of them is, what are your thoughts on using cop copper sulfate drench for controlling parasites? Uh, for sheep, I'm not in favor of that because the uh, Copper sulfate is a readily available copper so, uh, source and you really run a risk of uh, inducing an acute copper intoxication type scenario. Uh, I think you even run the risk in, in goats with that. The other issue there too is yes, we do know that copper um, ions can have some uh, uh, killing effect but only on hemonchus. Uh, so it's only the hemonchus, the barber pole worm, but that copper is really uh, affecting. And generally that's taking place, that's got to be in the abomasum. And so uh, it, you got to have that copper in there long enough in that abomasum to, to kill that. That's where, you know, the copper wire um, particles seem to do a better job. They, they lodge into the abomasal lining, release that copper ion, and slowly can kill off the hemonchus there. But a broad-based uh, uh, deworming approach, probably a little too risky in my book. Okay. And one last question pertaining to calcium. Uh, sources of a calcium other than alfalfa and how much? Well, the, the cheapest and simplest source of calcium would be like limestone, you know, just uh, calcium carbonate uh, feed grade. And, you know, you're looking at probably, uh, you know, it, depending on the scenario, maybe a, a, a quarter of an ounce to a half an ounce at, at most that you would have to incorporate in or, or go with a, you know, a higher calcium a trace mineral salt or something. Okay. Very good. With that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close down our, our question and answer question or session. And I uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Van Son, for answering all those questions well and patiently. <laughs> and I know our listeners appreciate that. And um, there's been a lot of information presented here tonight. And uh, there, uh, just to remind you all that this has been recorded and uh, will be posted. And you all will be receiving a follow-up email within the next 48 hours with a link to that recording if you uh, would like to rewatch this webinar uh, to absorb some more of that information. In addition, um, the slides from this evening's web webinar will be posted also, and there'll be a link to that uh, in that same email. So uh, if you want to refer back to some of these slides and, and uh, go through it at your own and, and absorb it, uh, that would be great. Uh, so I want to uh, thank uh, our speaker this evening, Dr. Bob Van Zahn from Penn State, for uh, giving us an excellent uh, uh, presentation and a great Q&A session. And I want to thank all our listeners for joining us tonight and uh, once again encourage you to visit the uh, ASI website at sheepusa.org and uh, you can access the uh, Let's Grow uh, materials under their programs um, menu item if you just click the rebuild uh, icon uh, that shows up there when you click on the uh, uh, programs menu item at the top of the page. Um, all of our past webinars are also posted up there and uh, you're welcome to uh, visit those at your leisure. So with that, I want to uh, go ahead and bid everybody a good evening and thank you all uh, for attending and wish you the best of luck in the future.